Okay, so this talk is, uh, is uh, called uh, Containers Without Demons, Internals of Podman. I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah, whatever. I don't have the t presentation, I don't have anything. Uh, Matt uh, called in sick. He's uh, got the Bruneau flu, and uh, so they asked me to come, and I've been asking. I should put up the uh, chat where I've been like desperately saying, can you send me the slides? Can you send me the, uh, he supposedly has extensive notes, and I know nothing about what uh, he was going to talk about. So I'm going to wing it. Uh, if you want to get on your phone right now and rate this the worst talk of the week, that's fine with me. Uh, but make sure Matt's name's associated with it. Uh, so hopefully, uh, I've tried to browbeat some uh, members of my team to come down. Uh, we're going to be talking, I guess, about uh, uh, everybody here. Anybody here see previous talks on Podman? How many people have played with Podman? How many people think Podman is the coolest thing in the world? <laughs> all right, all right. So um, I'll give you a little history of Podman. Podman was originally called K-Pod for Kubernetes pods. Um, and it's, uh, it was, we first started working two and a half years ago on Cryo. Um, and Cryo, uh, we wanted to basically build, you know, we felt that we were replacing the Docker daemon for running Kubernetes containers. And we felt that a lot of people SSH into a, uh, a, a node in the Kubernetes world. And they, you know, they have the ability now with Docker as a back end to do Docker commands. You know, Docker PS, show me the containers are running. Um, things like that. So what we wanted to do is basically build a tool originally called K-Pod um, that would um, act like Docker, but be able to see the stuff that uh, Cryo was using. Um, and over time, uh, well, first of all, we figured that K-Pod was a bad name. In the US, K-Pod is a, a coffee pod thing that you stick in. The, um, and uh, so we eventually renamed it Podman because it was managing pods. Um, and and uh, so we t took the effort, and we actually split it apart from Cryo at that point. Um, and uh, over time, it's evolved into what it is now. Uh, at the time, I actually had, I don't know, about six or eight interns. And I just put them on and said, here's the man page from Docker. Let's make that command in Podman. Here's the man page from Docker. Let's make that. Um, and so that, that's how it, it sort of evolved. Uh, eventually, we decided we needed a better um, database for running it. Um, so, so one of the problems when you, if you look at the Docker daemon, what does the Docker daemon do that's um, pretty cool anyways, is it basically keeps all its locks in memory. So if I want to kill a container and someone else wants to, uh, if I want to remove a container and someone else wants to exec it, there has to be locking to control, control that flow. Um, so if I want to uh, remove an image and I want to, you know, create a container off that image, there has to be control. Well, all that stuff was locked up into the Docker daemon. So the first thing we did when we started to build these tools is we wanted to move that stuff out of the daemon into the file system. So one of the first things uh, we had to build was a thing called container storage. So, uh, and we had to build the locking to container storage. So Nalan is getting nervous in the back of the room because I'm about to call him down and have him talk about how locking works in container storage. Nalan, come on down. Ah, there we go. Can people hear me? OK, well, uh, as Dan explained, the main uh, issue we ran into trying to do things on the same host that a Docker daemon was running on, and this goes back to even before we had started to work on Cryo, was that uh, essentially if you wanted to do anything that manipulated the actual storage that the Docker daemon was managing, you, there was no way to do it without surprising the daemon, because all the knowledge of the state and locking of the state and things that would you'd normally want to do to make sure you weren't trying to remove a container at the same time you were trying to launch a command running inside of it. Uh, that was all internal to a daemon because it was stored in memory. And it's a really good idea for performance reasons, but it made things very inconvenient for us. So when we sat down and needed to be able to do this from multiple processes, the first thing we had to do was take all the locking and move it into a place that multiple processes could access it. And the most obvious solution for that is file-based locking, which is what we do. I don't really know if there's more information about that. 
Well, tell them what, what's in container storage. Well, so. container storage contains, well, uh, that's a really bad use of phrasing. Container storage includes drivers, uh, many of the ones that you're familiar with from the Docker daemon. In fact, many of them are started off as the exact same code because it is forked from the code base. Uh, if you go back in the GitHub history, it's actually all the way back far enough, it, you're going to find Docker because that's where we started from. We didn't delete any of that history there. Uh, so it includes the drivers for the overlay driver, which we ditched in favor of the overlay 2 driver and just renamed to overlay the device mapper driver, um, BFS, sorry, ButterFS and ZFS, and of course the VFS driver, which doesn't do anything clever kernel side, but is very good for testing. On top of that, we, ended, we ended up putting in a new set of management functionality, so everything above that is brand new code, which manages layers, containers, and images in a fairly straightforward way because we didn't have a lot of plans for complexity at the time, and so far, mostly, it hasn't required a lot of weird stuff to retrofit additional things into it, um, but every now and again, it does. But that's really all it exposes. Um, at that point, we have the ability to create you know, layered file system storage, use copy and write semantics, do some deduplication with a, with a good amount of help from the image library, because the image library has to really know how to drive the storage library when you're downloading an image. And those things put together, along with something that you can use to launch a container, is the easy bits of writing something like Cryo, which is probably how we decided, yeah, we could actually do that. Okay. I'll let you off the hook now. You don't actually need the mic. I don't need the mic. That's right. Oh, watch your step. Uh, so actually, uh, the funny thing is this past week, I wrote a blog uh, that de delves deeply into container storage, all the dirty facts and things like that. Uh, and it covers a lot of stuff like where the content is stored. So uh, interesting facts like if I'm running containers by default, uh, the storage is in via live containers. Um, and if I'm running in my home directory, it ends up being underneath um, tilde, you know, your slash homes dot local slash share slash containers. So all that's covered in this blog up here if you want to take pictures. Um, but basically that digs deeply into everything, all the deep dark secrets that you really don't want to know about container storage. Um, but basically because of that, container storage is shared between all the tools that we're building, Builder. Uh, uses it, uh, LibPod, uh, Cryo, and Scopio can write to them. So um, container storage is a, is a key factor in the uh, use of uh, how Podman, internals of Podman. Um, another thing that Podman does um, underneath the covers is it uses uh, a thing called containers image. Containers image, if you saw my talk yesterday, I covered it a little bit. It's a library that allows you to pull and push images uh, from container registries. And it has a whole bunch of really cool features because it uh, traditionally all, you know, traditionally the implementation was just take an OCI image or a, a Docker image that's sitting at, uh, say, Docker IO, Quay.io, and you pull it into your local machine. Um, uh, well, container image has developed a whole bunch of other protocols. So basically really translation layers. So you can actually, um, I think, uh, how many people saw uh, uh, Matt's and Ravashi's talk yesterday on container security? So at the end of her talk, she actually pulled directly out of the Docker daemon and pushed into uh, container storage. So she actually was, I think she was running a pod, and she basically was uh, using Scopio to copy it out. But you can actually do things like Podman with a uh, Podman run docker dash daemon colon specify the image. And what will happen is underneath the covers containers image actually knows how to talk to the Docker daemon. Pull it. There's, there's seats in the middle up here if you people want to move in a little bit or let, the, let them by. Um, so containers image allows you to sort of have these translate. You know, it's basically doing uh, pretty much the same protocol over the wire, but it's able to pull from different types of container sources. So you can pull from the Docker daemon, you can pull from uh, local container storage, you can pull from a local directory, you can translate from traditional Docker, original Docker images into OCI images. Um, but that's all based in containers image. Um, at this point, I'm going to make Valentin come up and talk a little bit about it. And he can talk about Valentin has added some really nice features to really make pulling and pushing images faster. And I, I signed him up for a lightning talk, so I'll go to his lightning talk later. Cause, uh, so this is Valentin Rothberg. So I guess I can practice the lightning talk now. Yeah, this so is a lightning have, talk. So I have two lightning talks, so somehow a double one now. Um, 
Yeah, I, I didn't practice the lightning talk now because uh, that's somehow part of it. Um, I guess Dan wants me to talk a little bit about how we made pulling faster. Um, so just to say, I'm uh, pretty new to the game. Basically, most of or all of the work for Containers Image has been done by Miloslav, who is sitting there, and Antonio, who gave a talk about cryo uh, yesterday. Um, I don't see him here. He's also sick. <laughs> yeah, everybody has the burn flu. Um, but one of the, so we've been looking at the tools and uh, did some profiling and we're uh, checking basically where we can tweak a little bit to make it faster because we all want to execute containers, but it's nice when it's happening somehow in a, as fast as possible. And one of the bottlenecks that we've seen was um, image copying in this case. So as Dan has explained, there are many different so-called transport in the containers image library, which allows you to copy from a directory to a registry, from the Docker daemon into container storage, or also uh, um, between registries. So it basically doesn't have to be pulled first, but we can copy from registry A, maybe quail to docker.io, for instance. And the, initially, the containers image library hasn't been implemented in, in a way that it was meant to be used concurrently. But if we want to pull in parallel, well, we have to make um, sure that we don't corrupt our data, um, basically parallelization problems. And um, this is something we did last December, so it's rather fresh. So whenever we do a Podman pull, then could you, let's do a live demo. A live demo? Yeah. Dan is very brave. He always does demos live. Yeah, so and they usually blow up my face. And I'm in a comfortable position to blame him if it doesn't work because I'm not using the keyword, right? So when we do a Podman pull on, uh, for instance, let's do Nginx. No, it's N uh, N G I N X. Yes, yeah. yeah. It's, Right, so now we're trying to pull it, and then you should hopefully see that, yeah, here you can see it, the uh, progress bars uh, indicate, hopefully it was a short one here, that the pulling happens in parallel. Um, one other cool thing that we found, or basically that Gi Giuseppe found, you can say hello, he gave uh, yesterday a very cool talk with Akihiro, about rootless containers. And um, Giuseppe found also that uh, uh, so compressing the layers that um, basically a container image consists of, so basically all the data, when we compress it, it takes a lot of time. So um, he ported the tools to use a new compression library, uh, pgzip, I guess it's called, for parallel gzip. And in combination with the uh, parallel pulling, uh, pulling is now up to 50% faster, which is pretty impressive. For sure, it depends on the amount of layers that we have and on the size of uh, the individual layers. But this was a pretty, pretty cool improvement. Um, one thing we also are looking at at the moment is now we can pull in parallel. It would be nice, especially when we build containers, to push them also in parallel. Um, the containers image library now allows it, but we are still serialized by the locks in container storage that Nalin was talking about. Um, and now we are wrapping our head around uh, a pretty, pretty neat problem, which is how can we transition the locks of container storage in a way that uh, we can read in parallel. So we need to transform it into a uh, read-write lock, but, well, we have the problem many tools on the system are using the container storage library. If we update tool A with the read-write lock semantics, how can we somehow gracefully allow it not to corrupt the data of tools that are still using the old version? Um, I think there's a talk tomorrow about file locking, and I hope to, to uh, somehow talk to the presenter uh, a bit about that. Um, that's pretty much it. Good, thank you. We have a question, yes. 
You can interrupt at any time. I've gone through 20 minutes now. I have another 40 to go. <laughs> It only cut. So it, if you're copying, if you're copying an image that has ten layers, mm -hmm. and you only make a change in one of the layers, only that layer is going to get copied. And and that's it, um, actually if Vincent Batts was here, he could talk about some ideas he has. So right now, uh, images are based on tabwalls, and so you have to copy the entire, entire tabwall. And and there's some thought about changing that format, changing basically moving to an OCI image format number two and looking at it, can we do things at a lo lower level, at a block level? And um, there's been some talk about CA sync and these different protocols for you know, potentially storing your images in a, in a much easier format. Right now, if you create a layer that's a gigabyte in size, we end up moving a gigabyte of size across because of the format of tile balls. Um, so, so we've talked a little bit about the origins of, of Podman. Uh, we talked a little bit about, uh, uh, and by the way, Podman went uh, 1.0 uh, this week, so pretty cool, huh? Uh, so we re released it as 1.0. It's going to be, uh, it's in RHEL 7.5. Um, yesterday we had a talk on user namespace. How many people saw the user namespace talk yesterday? Okay, so Giuseppe and Akura over here, is my pronouncement right? have worked a lot on actually making a Podman, the real reason Podman, people are excited about Podman, in my opinion, is, is mainly around the rootless <laughs> stuff, but the, I like the fact that there's no big fat demon. Um, and they've done a lot of work uh, in the, outside of Podman to basically get uh, the ability to take advantage of the user namespace. Um, so uh, for the people that didn't see that yesterday, I'm going to make uh, Giuseppe come down and talk a little bit about user namespace and how we're internals, how we're setting it up uh, so containers will run inside of a user namespace on the host, and that's how you can run uh, containers um, as non-root. Yeah, so uh, we started using uh, user namespaces uh, first in the root version of Podman. And uh, user namespace basically allows uh, the containers, uh, the process running inside of a container to believe uh, uh, to be using a different uh, IDs than they're in reality uh, running. Uh, uh, so from the host, you can uh, you can see the the process is running with uh, a UID and group ID, but in reality, but in uh, but then in the namespace, the the process believes to have a maybe to be running like root, but. Uh, so once we had the support for namespaces in root. The next step was to to allow running uh, uh, Podman as a unprivileged user. Um, for doing that, uh, an unprivileged user, it's allowed uh, by Linux to create uh, a namespace where there is a uh, where there is just one mapping. You 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 can map your UID to any ID you wish, uh, and the application believes to be running with that ID, but for the system it's still uh, running as the original user. Um, so, uh, with, with the help of other tools like uh, a, a new ID map and new, new G ID map, it's possible to, to add uh, multiple IDs inside of the user namespace. So you, we, can, uh, we could really run any kind of application as uh, as a uh, privileged user, yeah. <coughs> well, uh, it's a question. So Flatpak does it. Uh, Flatpak's a my my understanding. Of Flatpak I, is it use bubble wrap underneath. Bubble wrap is its uh, container runtime, and bubble wrap was originally user namespace wasn't fully supported on top of RHEL. So bu bubble wrap is that actually a set UID application that actually does the configuration so that flat pack will work. I believe bubble wrap also has smarts in it to know if user namespace will work. It'll use that instead of the set UID. But I might be I might be totally lying to you now. Yeah, so. yeah flat pack. Uh, the new newer version of flat pack are using user namespace, and they use the simple version that just one ID is mapped. So. Uh, 
Yes, so the, the limitation of flatback, uh, well, we added the support for a uh, rootless network. Uh, you can have a network namespace inside of the contain. Instead of with a flatback hub, you run uh, with a network namespace of the host. Um, yeah, but the, the biggest difference is that in Flatback you have only one ID available. Instead with Podman, uh, you have yeah. multiple uh, IDs so you can run uh, any application. So let, let me show you an example of that. So there's a tool called Build to Run Share. And what Build to Run Share allows you to do is basically just enter a user. I didn't launch a container, right? I'm just regular Dan Walsh and I'm going to do a Build to Run Share. And suddenly, I'm inside of a container, I'm mean, inside of a user namespace. So I, again, I'm, I haven't taken Podman or anything else. Builder on Share just sets up the user namespace. And this is the same way Podman does. As he was explaining, we have the etsy sub UID file. Now, this, is, this file is on every single Ubuntu, Fedora. Uh, so Shadow Utils now populates this file. And what this file does is it actually allocates to D. Walsh 65,000 UIDs. So every user, and you see I added another user there on test, and that starts at the, the first UID available, so 165,536, and allocates that user 65,000. So as you add users to it, you will allocate UIDs. Um, what Shadow Tills also provides is that it's two set UID applications that allow you to basically allow you to tell the kernel to put the next process, the child process, into a user namespace. And what we map the user namespace for these containers looks like this. So if you look at that user namespace there, it says that my, my UID is 3267. So when I launched Builder on Share, it used those set UID applications from Shadow Utils to configure first my UID as being root inside of the container. And then it says for a range of one, so it's only basically allocating one. And then it start, says starting at UID one, map, six, uh, map UID one to 100,000, and then sequentially for the next 65,000. So what I can do, which is interesting, inside of the container now, is I can actually do a, I can create content So now I've created a directory and a file inside the directory <coughs> that's owned as bin bin. But it's owned as bin bin inside of the container, inside of the user namespace. Now if I go outside the user namespace to my home directory, it created as UID 100,000. So as you see, UID 100,000 was right, it was the first UID, it was mapped to UID 1. So if I wanted to create a file as owned by 2.2, it would be 100,001 and 100,002 in my directory. So this allows users now to use a far greater group of UIDs on the system. Um, and, but the interesting thing here is I can't remove it. So if I try to remove, I'm going to get permission denied because I'm not in the user namespace. So therefore, I no longer have that mapping of the extra 100,000 UIDs. But if I go back, and, and then the other thing is, if you look at my home directory now, everything's owned by D. Walsh. But if I look at the same home directory while I'm inside the container, everything's owned by root. Exact same files. So what's happening is the kernel is actually lying to me. The kernel is telling me that, oh, yeah, that's root, but really outside the container. It's based just inside, just inside my user namespace, it looks like root. If I went and put, I think Sally's talk yesterday, Sally and um, Matt showed a file owned by root. And if there's a file owned by root inside of my container, I see it as nobody, nobody. So it's a nobody user, or minus one. Um, and any UID that's not mapped. So if I try to interact with any files that aren't owned by me or any processes that aren't mapped into my user namespace, including root, then it treats as if they're, they're not existing. Thanks for helping out. Okay, so that's, that's sort of, that's some way we do the magic. Um, there's really cool features that have also been added to Podman uh, for running containers. 
Um, you can basically select different user name spaces. And we've added some optimizations to um, uh, one, one of the features over the years, I've been bad-mouthing user name space probably for the last five years. Not because user name space was bad, but because the file system doesn't understand user name space. So what we really would want is the ability to take an image and mount it into, if I want to run, say, the, the same image, say we talked about this 1.1 1. 1 gigabyte image earlier. If I have a gigabyte image on disk, I want to run it in two different containers. I really want user name space to be able to separate those two containers. The problem is I need, if I want it to look like root inside of a container that's running as 100,000, and I, run into, you know, I want it to look like root inside of a container that's running as user name space 200,000, I have a problem, right? And the problem is I have to chone the files. That there's no way to tell the operating system that while this file system inside the user namespace is in there, map that foo file that's owned by real root as if it's owned by 100,000 and map it in a different container as if the file that's owned by root in a different container is mapped as 200,000, right? There's no way to do that. It's been tried. I've been working with the kernel team for many years saying this has to be fixed in order for us to use user namespaces. Um, the problem with, uh, well, there's lots of reasons that it hasn't been fixed. Um, there has been attempts. The first attempt actually was we, uh, one of the guys that works with me, uh, Vivek Goyle, uh, was working, he works on most overlay file systems, and I wanted him to say, can you just do it in overlay? To me, it makes sense to do it in overlay. Uh, he actually presented a patch to do it in overlay, sent it to the upstream kernel, and they said, no, we don't want it in overlay, throw it away. There's another game, guy named James Barton, he works for IBM. Uh, he's a major kernel contributor. He's, he's like one of the top kernel contributors in the world. He built it a file system called ShiftFS that basically did the same thing. And this guy has pretty much, you know, Leonard's ear, I mean, uh, Linus's ear. Uh, Leonard would like that. Uh, he has Linus's ear. And he got shot down. The reason he got shot down is because we'd have a file system, like an overlay file system. Now I gotta map another file system on top of it, a shifting file system. We end up using up a different inode for each one of these and we had an escalation of the number of inodes. And they said, that's stupid. And they said, what we need to do is just do this at the VFS layer. So they, the kernel guys now are working at the VFS layer to do the shifting. So there was eventually, eventually what you're gonna have is you're gonna have a mount command, uh, basically like a bind mount. And when you bind mount, you're going to put it. You're going to specify that I want this inside of this user namespace. So it'll be a mount command that does that. And the, but the re, there's real tricky security here because and, and actually I don't like what the kernel guys want. The kernel guys want that to work both ways. So the kernel guys want to shift. What I would like is just a read-only shift, right? Because in, in containers world we don't write the lower layer. So if I shift it to the upper layer, I can write it to the upper layer. But the kernel guys want to be able to shift and actually write to the lower layer. So if I am in a user namespace running as 100,000 and I write a file, they want it put on disk as UID zero. So they want it shifted back. Um, and that's, there's reasons for that. And what they, they sort of want to do is basically specify, an admin could specify certain parts of the operating system to allow certain containers to be able to do that, but uh, so certain processes to be able to do that. In my opinion, in containers, we're not, we're not interested in that. So we just want to shift it at the higher level. So I'm really rambling on a lot about this, but uh, what's happened recently is uh, going, uh, so that's still out there. And again, you can imagine if I am a process running as you, non, you know, as D. Walsh, and I write a file and make a set UID and it gets, ends up on the operating system as root, that's a problem. So what happened is uh, recently is, um, so we've never been able to have it. So and the kernel guys continue to work on it, but I mean, this could be, the kernel works at a colossally slow pace for this stuff, and for a good reason. This could be major security issues. So Vivek Goyle, the guy that did overlay file system, actually, one of the ideas we had is in user space, we can handle this. We could actually chone all the files. So we can go through, if we're running as UID 100,000, we can take the image and say all root files are now gonna be owned as 100,000, and all, you know, one file to be known as 100,001 all, and we can actually write a chone, and Nalan actually has that built into container storage. So we can actually chone it. Well, if you run it on a, on a VM uh, with, say, Fedora, it takes about 30 seconds to chone the entire container. So what's happening in overlay is as I chone each one of those files, they get copied up. 
So if I had a gigabyte fi file system, I'd be copying up a gigabyte file system. What Vivek has done is he actually added a new feature to the kernel that actually just creates an inode on the overlay. So the overlay creates an inode now that points back to the lower level. That means if I'm copying up 1,000 files, I'm not actually copying them up. I'm just creating inodes related to those 1,000 files. So um, because of that now, we can actually create, use a namespace, separate a container. Instead of taking 30 seconds, we can do it in sub one second. So we're going to be announcing, uh, we have, I could demonstrate it, but I'm worried it's not going to work. So we'll hold off on that. But actually, what the hell? <laughs> OK, so we'll see if this works. So, um, am I in a, I'm fooling myself. Let's get to real root. So what I can do, I'm in run dash ti, user map, UID map, like that. Yeah, we'll find out in a second. Okay, we're gonna do uh, one 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 zero 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 a thousand Fedora shell. So theoretically, I believe I don't have a container that already has this. So it's gonna. This is basically saying map UID zero to what's that? A million eleven hundred uh, one hundred ten thousand, and starting at zero, we're gonna map a thousand UIDs. And let's see how long this takes. That's pretty good. Anybody know why that went so fast? Because it was a bug. It actually didn't run the container. So Nalan was right. So this is why it takes, look at that, it's taking forever. I'm in the container now. Yeah. That took 15 seconds. Not impressive. That's why you don't do live <coughs> demos. OK. So what happened here is I ran to the user namespace, same user namespace twice. Um, what we're doing now in container storage is we're caching the user namespace. So we went through and we choned everything um, in the container, and it created a uh, a new container. So every time we run the container from now on, or we'll run a container on that same user namespace, it's as fast as running any normal container. So we only do the chone <coughs> the first time. Now, what's weird here is it went, didn't go as fast as I thought it would. And that's the reason. Look at that. This is a teaching example. So one of the interesting things we can do in container storage inside of Podman or any, anything that uses libpod is that, or anything that uses container storage, sorry, uh, is you can actually set the flags on the mount points that you're going to create inside the container. So when I mount up the image, again, all this stuff is buried. If you're using Docker, you can't do any of this stuff. But in, in, in container storage, because we're trying to reveal the different parts, what you can do is you can actually set the mount options that are going to go in it. So we set, by default, I believe that the mount options on any storage device that's mounted into your container should be no dev. You shouldn't be using device nodes that happen to be on a storage layer. So by default, we're mounting containers as no dev. All right, that's a security feature that we haven't really talked about much. But I can also turn on, in order to turn on that fast um, new user namespace thing, I can turn on meta copy up. So what I'm going to do is, um, Somewhere along the line, I was I uncommented that, and I'm going to comment this one. And now, if the demo gods don't uh, blow this up on me, I'm going to change one little number here. So we are going to run in a different user namespace, and let's see. Ah. Seven seconds. Something went wrong. I'm not sure. That's why you don't do live demos. Um, anyways, it should have been real fast. I'm not sure. You'd have to dig into it. Am I using an older version upon me? Older version. Well, 1.0, yeah. Um,
coding on the fly while you're demoing. <laughs> Everybody watch me type my password. The tension is just immense in here right now. Okay? <laughs> it's tough to tap dance when you have this thing on your leg. <sighs> so anyways, the, um, it's kind of a new feature, right? It's kind of cool. Pretty much felt like normal speed of running a container. And if I ran it again, obviously it's going to be faster because it, it went through. But it actually went through the entire Fedora base image, choned every single inode, and created it on, on disk. Now those disks, that, that choned thing, disappears, right? We don't commit that as an image. We're never saving that. It's just for when we're running use namespace. So a future version, hopefully a very soon future version of Podman, I'd like to get, if you're running it as root, that to happen automatically. So all of a sudden, you, you, there'll be like a, a dash dash user namespace equals um, random versus, and then we'll pick out user namespaces and store it into uh, a storage layer to basically say we're running with, you know, which user namespace we're going to run it with. Um, so, uh, uh, but it's, you know, it's kind of a cool feature. It's still a little hacky, right? We're still taking almost a full second just to show in the file system. <laughs> At some point, hopefully before we all die, we will get a shifting file system into, and, and as I said, I've been talking about using namespace since sort of the Docker revolution, which is 2013. So we're five, six years, and I've said we needed a shifting file system. So we have a user space short, sort of shifting file system. Now, Giuseppe uh, also has built a Fuse overlay. So he took overlay and, and put it into Fuse, and he actually put shifting into his version of overlay. So we could use a Fuse file system on it uh, for doing this. As a matter of fact, if you ran, if you did similar things inside a, a rootless container, you would be taking advantage of Fuse overlay. So you wouldn't have to be doing the chone um, stuff that we're doing as root. Uh, so that's um, another thing. Let's look at another thing internal of Podman. Did the violin guys uh, check it out? Those bums. <sighs> OK, so there's a file here. Um, I think I made a move it. So, um, this is LibPod, uh, so basically Podman is a subproject of LibPod. We created LibPod, uh, so if you wanted, wanted to find out where the source, you want to contribute to Podman, it's actually on the GitHub container slash LibPod. So it's a p library for creating pods is what the, the, the um, goal was, and then Podman was like the initial implementation that uses that library. Um, the reason we did that is we wanted to, uh, we were talking to different people that might have been using uh, distributions other than Kubernetes, and they were interested in the concept of pods, and we wanted to basically build a library that people could start to experiment with pods. And for those that didn't see any other talks, Podman and, uh, has the ability to create pods. Now, pod is basically one or more containers running in the same namespaces. Well, not all namespaces, but basically like the uh, C groups namespace, uh, well, C groups, um, PID namespace, um, network namespace, and IPC namespace. And it runs with the same SE Linux label. So it's really sort of a, uh, a way of grouping multiple containers together. And those containers always run t together. And that's what, how Kubernetes runs pods. How Kubernetes sort of developed the concept of pods. And a lot of people like to build pods. The secondary container is called a sidecar container. You can have 50 containers there, but usually people have maybe two containers inside of a pod. And, um, and that secondary container usually is watching the primary. So it's like making sure it's working right. Uh, uh, so you can do health checks, things like that inside of it. Um, actually, anybody here hear Istio, I-S-T-I-O? 
um, that's actually using, in Kubernetes, that's actually using, there's a sidecar container that gets launched with each one of your containers and um, uh, actually sets up a side network for the container processes to work. So that's how they do their, whatever STO does, um, it's doing with sidecar containers. Uh, <laughs> I can only know so much. Uh, so anyways, Lib LibPod was, so we originally, we were designing LibPod to be able to do that. Um, and then Podman was sort of the tool that we experimented with. Um, if it come, came to other talks, we, uh, my talk yesterday, I showed you running containers inside of a pod um, and, and stuff like that. Uh, but we also, underneath the covers, we actually have um, tools that are launched. And because distributions ship these executables in different paths, we actually uh, sort of a lot, these are the search routines for figuring out which path. So we look for run C in a whole bunch of different places. We look for conmon path in a whole bunch of different places. So when we launch a container, we first thing we do underneath the covers is we launch this program called conmon. So one of the, you know, if I'm running a container, if I go and run a container on the system, and I'm going to do bash D of Fedora. That's probably kind of critical. And I'm going to just do uh, sleep 1000. Podman exits. The container is running on the system, right? So in the Docker world, the Docker daemon theoretically is watching that container. Well, there is no more Podman there. So we need something to watch the container. So if I went onto the system, which I could do this correctly. You'll see Conmon's running. And remember, I talked about the pod. You'll see Conmon running there, and it's running a pause container. So it runs a pause container in Conmon. So Conmon is monitoring the pause container. And then the, down below, there's some Kubernetes containers running on my machine. And you can see them running sidecars. And let's see if we can find the sleep that I just launched. Okay, so right here, we have sleep running on the container. So Conmon is actually running. Now, if I wanted to go into that container and Podman, if I want to do a Podman exec, exec into that container, See basically three processes running. One of those is running sleep. Uh, what's the command to? So it's running sleep 1000. So what I just did, what happened when I ran Podman there, Podman actually connected to the Conmon. So inside of the inside of the Podman database, there is a link that says this container is running underneath Conmon and it's running with this PID. Um, and so we connected to Conmon. Conmon then injected us into the container. So exactly, exactly the container. That's why we're demonless, right? We don't need a big fat demon sitting out there watching it. We just have this little tiny program. And, and that program is just a little C program that's just really watching for the, it keeps open its TTYs and it's just watching for the container to exit. And when the container exits, it ca captures its exit code and then writes it to a, a directory which Podman then can look, go look at. So if I want to know why this container exited or what the exit code was, was successful or not, I can go and look at that. So that's all the stuff happening under the covers. This is the same exact root tool that Cryo uses. So you can, anybody that's played with Docker over the years knew that you could never restart the Docker daemon. If you restarted the Docker daemon, all the containers would go down. Okay? Uh, later container, now later Docker versions actually use container D as a separate process. So now I could cycle Docker, but you could never cycle container D. I don't know if that's been fixed at this point, but basically you always had the, you know, anytime you wanted to upgrade, if you want to upgrade Trio, you can upgrade it because these conmons are running. And obviously you can upgrade the conmons, but the next time the conmons run, they'll, they'll um, fix that. Um, so,
Anything else of interest in here? So um, we'll show you a couple other things. Have a question? I love questions. Yeah. Help me okay. tap the answer. <laughs> yes. Uh, asking slowly, yes. Correct. Right. So um, the the question is, uh, Docker basically a lot of people wrap Docker containers inside a systemd unit file. So at boot time, I I communicate with the Docker daemon and say start you know nginx, or I'd start some container. Um, so what? In, in, in the Docker world, they had things like restart, auto restart for a container or, or uh, different ways of uh, starting containers. And in the Podman world, we say put Podman directly into the system to unit file. Matter of fact, we don't support re auto restart. Auto restart in our mind makes no sense at all because we don't have a daemon. Well, we do have a daemon. It's called system D. It's in charge of starting processes on the system. So we would say if you wanted a, you know, if I want to run a container at boot up time, I would put Podman into the unit file start, uh, to, to automatically start. We actually, if I look at, there's a thing called, I was going to try to get people to talk about Violink, uh, but this is actually a decent example. Okay, so um, one of the things we have, so we have the, the concept of Podman remote, which actually, again, we don't have a daemon. We don't have the Docker daemon sitting out there listening on a CLI. Uh, so what we added is basically a mechanism for uh, socket-activated Podman. So what's that? I need power. Ooh. That's good. I get out of the rest of the talk when I lose, run out of power. So, anyways, the the um, so this is an example of running Podman in a in a unit file. And usually, we tell you to create the container and then just do a starts and stops. Um, so, on the uh, exec start, you do a start of a container, and when you were done with the container, you would do a stop of the container um, in the unit file. Um, but that leads me into the Vileg stuff. clear it. So one of the things we wanted is we wanted a mechanism. Uh, there's a couple advantages to what Docker did in that they had a daemon that listened to uh, other protocols or to listened to, to a protocol to talk to it um, that you could basically do. A lot of people probably played with the Python bindings to Docker. And what the Python bindings do is they talk to the Docker daemon. And what we needed is a way for Python users to be able to use um, Podman basically be able to use Podman. We also wanted uh, Node.js users to use it so we could plug it into Cockpit. Um, and we wanted Mac users to be able to use it remotely. So we actually created, we don't have a daemon, we actually have a socket-activated Podman that when you connect to the socket, it will talk a protocol to you that will launch a container. But it's basically every time you launch a container, it launches a different Podman. Yes? It's infinitely possible, yes. <laughs> Maybe not a good idea, but no. So if you you'd have to run a privileged container, a, a unprivileged, a privileged container would. I mean, a privileged, a lockdown container would not allow you to set up user namespace and things like that inside of a container. But um, anybody that's well, we had meetings earlier today talking about uh, there's a new thing called Toolbox, and Toolbox is actually a new uh, desktop item where you'll be launching. Uh, terminals and the terminals will be running Podman under the covers and actually sticking you into a privileged rootless container, which seems like an oxymoron. But uh, and then inside of that, if you wanted to run Podman to to a rootless Podman to create more containers, you could do that. Okay. So yeah, you could. Uh, and matter of fact, one of the demos we we did yesterday and Sally did it uh, is actually running Builder inside of a Podman container. So it's a really good use case is actually distributing out your builds inside of, say, Kubernetes or something. Imagine firing off 100 
builders to build all your images. So if you have a CI CD system, you could plug it into Kubernetes, have Kubernetes take all your Docker files and, um, and put them into uh, individual containers and have builder actually process them. The current people do that now. The way they do that is they take the Docker socket, probably the most dangerous thing in the universe, and stick it into the container. And they, do it, they can do it in a locked down container, right? But if I can talk to the Docker socket, I have more power than sudo without password. Okay, because I can, I as the hacker can wipe out any logs of me doing anything on the system. So putting Docker into a container, it just gives sudo root. Matter of fact, anybody that wants, anybody like Sally who showed that she's using the Docker, there's, there's a way to set up Docker so that it has the group Docker. Anybody seen this? So you can do six, uh, 660 on the Docker socket and then you put yourself in the Docker group and now all of a sudden you can run Docker as non-root. Woohoo, great. And those same people, I say, well, why don't you just run sudo docker and just allow them to go with no password? And they say, no, that's dangerous. Well, there's a problem with that. Okay, you're giving them full root to your machine and they can wipe out anything they do on it, right? All I have to do is a docker run dash t ti slash slash ho colon slash host. Um, might as well show it. Okay, all right, all right. So if I do this, dash host, so, on slash, whoop, I'm doing it the wrong way. Slash host, dash dash privileged, Fedora, to root, slash host. Guess where I am? I am root on that host, right? I have turned off because I can run privileged, right? There's no controls on what you, options you can hand to the Docker socket. I'm out of time. Awesome. <laughs> okay. So anyways, I become root in the system. I go and do my evil, malicious things as a developer, which is what we're going to do if you give me root to your system. And then uh, not only that, but I can, after I'm done, I can do a podman or Docker RM, the container. And if you didn't set up container, journaling uh, to journal and just had basically log files, it will wipe out the log file. All right? Now, how was that for made up on the fly? All right? All right. <laughs>